If you've been following my channel, you've probably noticed that every year I help MAGFest, a gamer convention, with their swages, a sort of handheld video game system. And I also enjoy VR chat. So this year I asked the bizarre question, can I run VR chat, a VR game that takes a $3,000 investment in hardware to really enjoy, on a handheld video game system powered by a $1 processor, the ESP32 S2? I've got a level with you. I probably wouldn't be making this video right now if the answer wasn't just a little bit of a yes. Swages have been a mainstay of my involvement with MAGFest since they were powered by an ESP8266 in 2017. Every year we make 2,000 to 3,000 of these handheld video game systems, and every year they have a different I.O. complement and games written specifically for that year's MAGFest by the people in the MAGFest community. Previous years, we would in some cases only have LEDs, sometimes an OLED display, various button configurations, and processors. But this year, we moved to the ESP32-S2 microcontroller, a processor designed to operate little more than a light bulb. The most important addition this year, however, was a beautiful 280 by 240 pixel RGB display. Starting last year, I helped run the VRChat portal at MAGFest. It's where there's a camera in real life that streams audio and video from the real world onto a screen on the wall in the virtual harbor, where players around the world can join and see everyone at MAGFest walking by. And, through the power of a screen and some speakers, people at MAGFest can see them. It has been awesome to see people's reactions and witness the connections people could make across the digital boundary. Friends who couldn't make it to MAGFest could see each other, chat, or even take selfies together. Memes that started in VR chat but got lost in reality looking for DeQueen, asking people native to their meme country if they knew Dewey. It was only logical that I would want to find a way of merging these two interests. For the swages, I've been maintaining a flight sim, a really basic game mode where you fly through a similar but legally distinct 3D model of the Gaylord National Resort, where MAGFest is held every year. GP Lord originally designed this 3D model for our MAGFest VR chat world two years ago, and once he was done, he made a really low-fi version with only 3,700 vertices, 5,800 edges, and only 560 triangles so that it could be rendered on the swage. Normally, in the flight sim mode, you just fly around through 14 rings and collect 69 baked beans humming along, and originally it was on an ESP8266 and ran only on a 128 by 96 pixel OLED display. This year, we had a small boost to the CPU power, going to an ESP32 S2, and we got beautiful higher res color LCDs. We wanted to give the flight game a huge boost to really make it more fun so people would play it. So this year, we, we did that. We added a flashing color feature and fixed a long-running bug in the flight code. Surely that's enough, right? But there were three months left before MAGFest, and with the final touches of the game for the 1.0 firmware in, with three months to sit on my hands before I'd see everybody at MAGFest, I had to do something. I couldn't shake it. Maybe the stream. No vision of VR chat running on a swag was the direction instead of just some harebrained fever dream from when I had COVID. First of all, I would need some way to render more than just the wireframe of the atrium out from the swag. I'd need a way to draw people, guns, and bullets, as I called them. All of the rendering for the flight game on the swage is done in fixed point math instead of floating point. The positions of all of the objects are held in units of 1 48th of a meter. That way, there's no decimals. Then, all of the objects are sorted from farthest to closest. That week, we can blast through all of the objects, plastering them on top of each other just like an artist draws a picture. This technique is actually called the painter's algorithm. It wasn't hard to just add some new object types, maybe a set of interconnected lines that could just be a unique color. I didn't know what player skeletons were going to be, so I just made up a brand new model format and YOLO'd it out to the screen. I also wanted to render other ships flying around on the swages so that the players could see each other. For this, I needed a new model, and I messaged GP Lord again, and he's like, gotcha fam. 15 minutes later, I had these new super stripped down M-Wings. I'd need some basic info, like objects' positions and velocities, maybe some relationship between players and uh, bullets, since everybody loves flying around and blasting each other with lasers. All of the data needed to render all of this would need to be small, since there was only around 80 kilobytes of fast memory left. And, more importantly, everything that we would need to send and receive would need to fit into very small ESP-NOW packets. 
Adding special rendering code to all of these new objects was pretty straightforward. The rendering basically uses regular 3D matrices and vectors, which are all fixed point. It's actually the same code I copied from when I broadcast analog television with an ESP8266. For the networking, ESP now made it so that the swages could talk to each other directly and, at the same time, a central swage that would be plugged into the computer running the VRChat portal. ESP now is a wireless protocol that allows Espressif chips to send small 256-byte packets to one another using regular Wi-Fi packets, but they need no IPs or even a connection to a network. Any swag running the free play version of the flight sim within the range of another would let the user see each other. It even supported up to 80 or so swages in the same space at the same time. I had to do some tricks like using virtual clocks allowing each swag to have its own time base and generate events like blowing up or shooting bullets to be synchronized in spite of dropped packets. Using virtual clocks let you determine when an event happened on a separate swag in a local swag's time base and without the need for pings. The timestamps were just 32-bit numbers in microseconds. One fun thing about 32-bit timestamps is when you store them all as 32-bit numbers, wraparound and overflow errors aren't a problem if you just put in a little bit of care and mind your sign. There's one thing that remains a big concern, and that's RF interference. From experiments previous years, I knew that MAGFest, with its convention halls full of people, makes it very hard for Wi-Fi devices to communicate. To make matters even more disastrous, the VRChat portal was to be set up right next to the LAN room. If a swag begins to hear the transmission from any other Wi-Fi device on its channel, it will begin decoding that transmission, and any other transmissions that come in, in the meantime will be lost. For instance, if the sender doesn't know to wait, one swag could be sending a message to another, completely oblivious that the other one was already receiving a message from another source, also called the hidden node problem. Another issue is that if there is a transmission detected, a sender would hold off because of carrier sense multiple access. So, sometimes packet transmissions could be delayed by 100 milliseconds or more. With these issues, neither the portal or competitive fast-paced head-to-head sci-fi flight free-for-all dueling would be any fun at all. We were going to have to put earmuffs on the swages. If they can't hear distant wireless devices, then those distant wireless devices can't cause any problems. We actually did this previous years by accident by putting a metal plane immediately behind the built-in antenna on the ESP module. No such luck this year though, we'd actually follow the proper design guidelines and with thousands of swages already in production, there was no hope of changing that now. Not that putting copper on the wrong plane was an efficient or reproducible solution anyway. We'd have to hack the ESPs to put those earmuffs on in software. Espressif doesn't document their Wi-Fi silicon or provide source to their libraries that use it. I knew that this would take several hundred or even thousands of experiments to figure out how to give the ESPs some hearing loss. I had another trick up my sleeve. When I was optimizing the drawing code for the swages, I wrote a tool that could help me rapidly prototype code. Anytime a source file was saved, the tool automatically compiled and ran the code on the device in about a quarter of a second. This meant that I could recompile and test all sorts of wacky ideas. I was able to shoot through 10 or even 20 development cycles every minute. Instead of being strategic with what registers I wanted to explore, I just sprayed and prayed. A coffee-fueled morning, forgotten afternoon, sleepless night, one breakfast, one lunch, and a sad girlfriend later, I had some curse code that did the trick. The virtual earmuffs were created. We could convince the hardware to reduce its IGI or input gain by several dB. The swages could now talk much more reliably with each other at the cost of range. Also, to prevent other interference and save battery life, I significantly reduced the TX power. I made sure that the swages could still talk about 25 feet or 8 meters apart. It's not the 1500 feet or 450 meters that ESPs normally get, but for swages, this is exactly what we wanted. Well, we added multiplayer to a second tier MAGFest swage game. And this is nothing new since the headliner game Swage Bros was doing this already. So far all of these changes only let people play in meet space with each other. No one in VR chat could participate. The Swages have a USB port, so by using HID API, a very simple cross-platform library able to send messages to and from USB devices, and a special USB descriptor that tells Windows to allow apps to use the USB device without administrator access, 
We could now connect a swage to a desktop PC that could act as a bridge, hearing all of the updates from all the swages in the area. Once the events were on the desktop, I needed a way of getting the data to everybody in the MagFest VR chat world. One technique is to use video players. In VR chat, you can use video players to play video streams, like of concerts or DJ spinning or whatever else. But we needed to send in game data, not video. Both LOX and AC Chosen already have used video players to stream data into VR chat worlds, uh, mostly by just making data ride along with the video. LOX wrote Shader Motion to enable streaming, recording, and playback of people dancing. And AC Chosen has already used video players to stream DMX lighting data from real world instruments into VR chat club worlds. The only issues when using color to encode data inside a video is that it's really inefficient. For 80 plus ships flying around and shooting bullets, it would be infeasible to encode all of that data as colors with enough reliability. This is where I had the second ace up my sleeve. About two years ago, I wanted to teach myself how the video encoding format H.264 worked. I learned to encode raw binary data as a video stream, sidestepping all the compression. Using H.264 fun, I was able to take the raw data of all the ships flying around and the bullets that they shot, and then broadcast that data through RMTP to VRCDN, a cloud content delivery network. VRCDN then broadcasts RTSP streams to all the players in the VR chat instance around the world, most of whom with less than 80 milliseconds of latency. Because there was no encoding going on, we could save time and not worry about encoding artifacts in addition to freeing up the encoder and OBS to stream the data of the video coming from the webcam back at the portal. There were some restrictions about zero-bit runs, so I needed to encode the data a little bit creatively, but I was able to get the data through. We ran into some subtle issues on a few people's systems with unusual video settings that made the raw data not have a one-to-one -one relationship. In future projects, instead of asking users to turn off settings in Windows, we could probably resolve most of our issues just by encoding 6 bits of data per component instead of 8. Once the raw data was in the world, the in-game video players could then place the video data on a texture. That texture could then be exported to other things in-world, one of those being a CRT or custom render texture that could parse the data coming from the video stream into a format that was easier to deal with. That data could then be loaded onto a pile of triangles with the geometry shader to take the data from that CRT and rotate and translate the source triangles to twist them into rendering the M-Wing ships and bananas in the VRChat player's world. This allowed them to see the high-fidelity versions of the M-Wing ships and the bullets that the swages were shooting out. This was fun for players in VRChat, but they needed a way to defend themselves from the swage players flying around and shooting them with bananas. Thankfully, Drake and Stark had been working on a system of banana guns for the VR chat users so that they could shoot bananas. Once Draken was done, he gave me a wonderfully basic interface so that I could add some code to handle things like when the bananas were fired, or informing me when the banana gun is picked up so that I could render the bananas and the guns on all of the swages. I just wrote some glue code that takes this data and puts it into a constant buffer that's accessible by a small strip of pixels that lives on the left side of the VR chat window. I also output the data from AudioLink, a tool in VR chat that does sound reactive lighting, so that the lights on the real life portal or the lights on my computer case for the mobile portal would match the visual effects in world on people's avatars. I found an API in VR chat that allowed me to export skeletal data for players, so I piled that in the exported strip of pixels as well. To prevent resource issues or the annoying yellow border or having to write thousands of lines of code to implement Windows streaming, I found that I could just use the old Windows 3.1 GDI from 1992 to grab a handle to the VR chat window and print it to a buffer inside of my application. From there, I could sift through the pixel data and reconstruct the original data. I first stripped off the color data for the music. I sent that to a swag that was flashed as a DMX controller, which lit up the light tubes around the portal to be in sync with the DJs DJing and other lighting effects in world. Then I used skeletal data to create small stick people skeletons of everybody in VR chat. Because it was using the actual skeletal data for players in VRC whose full body was on, you could see them dancing around on the swag. Yes, even this potato of a game system supported legs. 
I took these stick figures, gun locations, and bananas as they were being fired and sent them all out through the bridge swag that took in the ESP Now data. This way, the players in VR chat could actually shoot back at the swag players and blow them up. People had a lot of fun, and players ran around having a ball, firing bananas at each other, at ships, and ships blowing each other up too. You might be wondering, what happens when people playing on the swages shoot back at the players in VR chat? Nothing. That's what happens. In VR chat, data on the GPU can't go back to the CPU without extreme performance implications. It's like a trap door. Data can flow from the CPU to the GPU, but not from the GPU back to the game logic itself. At least the data can't go back until we get async read back. We had our main portal, and sometimes a mobile portal that we set up inside the atrium. We had a great DJ lineup, tons of people taking pictures on both sides of the portal, people memeing off each other, dancing, trading up, hanging out, and even chatting. Jazzy Senpai, our last DJ of the night, asked us if she could stay on after her set and play some Jackbox games. Perplexed, we said sure, since they were also the project lead of VRCDN, that little service that was powering most of this data flowing back and forth. So we weren't going to stand in the way of any of her ideas. Jazzy started a game, and people on their cell phones in the real world and VR chat joined it. It was incredible to see how engaged people across this digital divide could play together. Looking at this, I had to ask myself, did Jazzy's popping open a session of Jackbox games accomplish everything that we had hoped with our months of reverse engineering, designing, and executing? Well, you can tell me down below in the comments section. Thanks for hanging on for this long of a video. I wanted to thank VRChat for this great platform, the Swage team, the VRChat portal team, MagFest for giving us these opportunities, the portal moderators, and VRChat players who came out, and my girlfriend for editing the script. And you. Thanks for watching. Haha, <laughs> take that!